And greetings, everybody. Welcome to the May update in the community garden. My name is Tim McDermott. I work for OSU Extension here in Franklin County, and we are going to continue with our monthly seasonal programming held in partnership with a local community garden or urban farm. We are hosting this in a webinar format just to make sure that we don't have any disruptions to our learning tonight. And what I would like, if everybody has a question, feel free to ask away, dump them in either the Q&A or the chat. And periodically what I will do is head up there and address those questions. So the partner tonight is Paula Penn Nabrit of the Charles Madison Nabrit Memorial Garden. And I had the opportunity this weekend on the beautiful, beautiful Saturday morning to head over there and shoot some footage. So I'm going to let Paula um, give you some narration of a virtual tour of the Charles Madison and Britt Memorial Garden starting in the high tunnel section. Thanks, Tim. So here's one of my sons, Damon, working on the on the high tunnel. And so the making sure that everything is, is covered. And then this is the hydroponics and the farm bot that um, has been designed and put in place by the students, some of the students at the College of Engineering at the Ohio State University. So it's been super exciting. Um, and they are making signage. So we'll be able to use all of this in our summer day camp, STEM to STEAM, it's all in the garden. So that is wonderful. The hydroponic has, you can't see, but there are like holes drilled all the way through. Or we'll be able to grow plants in there and then water from the gutters on the high tunnel come through and go through that whole process using gravity. So that's pretty exciting. And um, again, there's a lot to be done there. That is one of the two compost systems that the other, one of the other teams at the, oops, sorry, my timer went off. And then there's the small shed. There you see the rest of the original garden and the, uh, some of the students from Nourish. You can also see at the very, very back, the second compost unit that the engineering students built. The student off to the side there talking to me is one of the students with the club Nourish at Ohio State. So all that amazing gravel that you see in the pathways, those students lined the pathways with ground cover that we got from Tim McDermott and the Buckeye ISA. And then they shoveled in all of that, all of that gravel, almost 20 tons worth. And so this was my thank you Saturday for them because they did so much work. So I wanted to feed them. And I think my time has elapsed, Tim. And am I, did I do that correctly? You did awesome. I just want to pan back and show um, that right here is the gravel that Paula was mentioning. It's, um, it, it's wonderful when you can do a infrastructure improvement like this in your garden, because now with Sunbelt under this, there's not going to be any weeds. And with the gravel in the pathways, when you have a day like today, where it is just pouring down rain, it, it's just an absolute wonderful thing in order to be able to walk through your garden without getting in mud. And then I've got to go back to this picture right here because I had simply texted Miss Paula if I could uh, show up if there was going to be any, um, you know, work parties or something going on at the garden for the weekend because I was planning on going out Thursday, but it was super rainy on that day. And so Paula said, well, come on out. We're having a little thankful um, gathering and it, lo and behold, I show up and, and just so you know, Miss Paula is the hostess with the mostest. Uh, she put a spread out that was unbelievable. Um, and so that was my unbelievable luck to show up and crash a party that I wasn't really invited to that had lots of fun people in an amazing day. Um, with wonderful food. And in fact, we're going to close with one of the wonderful food things. But let's get started. And let's talk about what we like to talk about in these monthly updates. And that is what do we do right this minute? What is going on right this minute in the garden? So you know me, I love talking about weather predictions, and we just had a new one. So this is the old one month. And this is what we were talking about in April about what to expect with May, we were going to have a lot of moisture so far so good. And then we were going to have above normal temperatures as a higher percentage 
for Ohio. And then they just came out with uh, just a few days ago on the uh, last day of April, they've adjusted this. So the new weather predictions for May have that same higher than normal moisture, but average chances of normal temperature. So not any greater than normal or lower than normal chance for colder weather or warmer weather. So that's a great thing for me when I'm thinking about my stuff, because quite honestly, a really hot spring messes with all of my cold weather crops, but moisture really doesn't. Tons and tons of rain on tomatoes um, or cucumbers or something like that. I'm starting to worry about fungal disease, powdery mildew, the blights, things like that. But to be real honest with you, my cold season brassicas and my lettuces and the greens, they like the moisture. They like as much water as they can get. So I see this and this makes me happy. This gives me a little bit more chance that I might throw in some extra spinach or some lettuce if you haven't done that now. But we're going to talk about what to plant now. So they have not adjusted um, the May, June, July. This was uh, April 15th, and, and this was actually shared after our April update. What they're saying through the summer, it's going to be probably hotter than normal. And, and that is what we've seen every summer for the last several uh, very, very hot temperatures. That is worrisome to me because we have had multiple summers in a row where we get that 90 degrees plus during the day. And then what's really bad for the vegetables is it stays above 70 at night. And that's why we had blossom drops and other things like that. But where we've kind of had the water turn off the last several years, where we get to that sort of mid-June and then the rain stops and it doesn't start again until mid-September, they're saying that the chances are greater than normal for above average precipitation. So uh, if you're like me and you dislike spending hours and hours deep irrigating your community garden, perhaps we will get some rain this year uh, and we'll see what we get. To this point, it's been an outstanding spring, notwithstanding just the last few days. Uh, we have had really good weather for growing and, and that's been reflected when you look at lawns and you look at the spring flowers and the trees and all of those things and, and when you take my allergies into consideration because boy I have had some serious allergies this year it's all been driven by what's known as growing degree days we have had great growing degree days days where the plants can grow and do well um, we are above we're in the top couple of years in the last 10 for that and that's been reflected in what's been growing outside how about that cold snap from a week or so ago? That was something. This was a picture that I took when I came into my work. This is not edited. This is not a black and white photograph. This is a color picture. And uh, that was quite something. I had actually gone um, and made sure that I double covered my plants. I had plastic over top row cover because there is a lot of plants in here that are cold tolerant but not necessarily bomb proof like see this is spinach and kale I didn't throw anything over it and they're just fine right now but I didn't want to mess with some of the tender lettuces and, and some other things that I had in there um, I didn't want to get any even just some frost damage to them and then uh, we had like three days of this I came in and pried the cover off and everything did fine in there but during that same spell, you know, I notice folks plant early every year, you get a nice warm day and, and we had had some warm days and so I saw tomatoes and peppers and things going into my community garden and you really need to watch your micro environment. So my community garden is at the base of a large hill. And so, as I've mentioned, if it's at say 40 degrees at my house, it frosts at the community garden. And when we get some really cold weather, this is what happens. So this grower has to um, replant uh, peppers and tomatoes because lost it due to that frost damage. And that kind of ties into what people have been asking me a lot lately. Tim, can I plant my tomatoes? Tim, can I put green beans in the ground? Things like that. And let's look at this 15 day prediction. We have still some days are going to get cooler. If you have a great micro environment, you might not hit 38 degrees. But overnight on Friday the 7th, 38 degrees up at my house is going to be a frost down at my garden. Now I don't tremendously worry about frost with my cool season vegetables as long as it's not a hard freeze. And I have row cover if I need to protect them. But Couple this with the fact that we are really pretty much right on the edge of 60 degrees. I'm not putting my tomatoes in yet. 
Uh, if you have the ability to protect them, maybe pre-warm the area, have a really great micro environment, and you want to put them in, if you have to put them in, and some people do, I'm getting real close. My tomatoes under the lights are just about outgrowing the space, uh, and that's common at this point. I am targeting probably this early next week after this, I still have worries with these 40 degrees. I'll be honest, if I can keep the plants going and hold off until we get closer to that Thursday or that Friday, which is right around our average last frost date, I'll be able to check the weather for 15 days past this point, making sure that I'm not putting them in too early. Okay, now remember, I do talk about doing some experiments and we're going to talk about that in a second, but tomatoes, ideally, it has to be above 60 and ideally they want that soil closer to about 70 degrees. Um, and remember, if you do like I do and you bury your tomatoes deeper so that you get that adventitial growth out of the stems, you might find if you go down eight inches or nine inches, you're in the 50s and tomatoes grow poorly in cool soil like that. They don't uptake nutrients. So you're not really getting extra time. They're going to grow best when we get warm weather. Little container garden update. I have made a decision that I am going to adjust how I grow. And that was based on looking at that severe amount of heat potential that we have. So I protected it over the winter. My spinach did great. My garlic's doing great. I um, planted a bunch of lettuces in some of the open containers. Every year for the last several, I've been taking my containers from one area and dragging them to the side of the house because it gets more sunlight there. I'm pretty much going to take my container garden offline for the summer because this micro environment was just so hot last year. The only thing that could grow was basil and peppers, and they grow fine down at my community garden, right? Black pots right on the driveway, right by the house. It's 95 degrees at high noon, and this soil in these pots are probably 120, and these plants die um, because it just dries out and it cooks them. They're, they just get too hot. So I'm going to leave this containers in place. We're we're going to probably after the garlic harvest, uh, maybe put a little basil in here, but then I'm going to wait until September when we start to get back thinking about cool weather and I'm going to replant that with lettuce. All right, we got some chat. We got some uh, other things. Planted garlic in the fall and is doing well. Is it possible to remove it from my landscape and plant it at Wallace so the kids can watch the garlic grow during the summer? Um, Debbie, I wouldn't because we're now getting to the point where you should have a good root volume. That garlic is getting ready to, um, it's getting ready to basically start to bulb up in that place. You could plant some down there right now. You're probably not going to get as big of bulbs, um, but you could still put garlic in the ground and demonstrate to the students, um, you know, how garlic grows and how it works like a um, like the alliums do. The other thing that you could do, I'll head back into that question with Debbie is, you could plant shallots. Shallots mature within the year, um, and, and that would be a really good way for a little bit faster kind of taking a look at an allium that would divide. All right, Adrian asks, I bought starter plants for my containers. I'm curious for leafy greens and herbs if I should limit one plant to each container or if I can risk adding an additional plant. Um, so depending on the size of the container, you can do that. My big containers that I, you can see right here, I, I have no problem putting four or five basils in there. And honestly, I've put up to 12 heads of lettuce in one container. And then what I do is for the basils, if I had three, four plant, plants in there, I'm not worried about it. These are big containers. And then for the lettuce, what I do is I harvest every other head and that allows me to let the remaining heads expand and fill the space. And then Melissa asked, Tim, will you trim the tops of your tomatoes if they're getting too big before planting? I, Melissa, I will not because that's the main stem leader on them. And if I trim the tops of them, then I would have to uh, train a sucker into becoming the new main stem leader on my, in, um, on my tomatoes. And then anonymous attendee says, is it too early to plant cucumbers and summer squash? For sure. Um, unless you do a little bit of stuff. And I'm gonna talk about that here in a minute because um, like I like to say, uh, seeds are cheap, vegetables cost money. And if you have some extra seeds and you have the space and you have the ability to protect them, then maybe. Okay, so 
I have um, always encouraged folks, you know, when you keep your data and you keep your records, try new things, see what you like in your garden. And then if you have something that doesn't work for you anymore, get rid of it. So new stuff this year. Um, I had mentioned that I was worried because the last several years we have just had screech and heat in the middle of the summer and I don't want to have that period of blossom drop. So I did buy um, a variety of heat tolerant tomatoes and I'm going to put one of those in and I'm going to see if that makes a difference with harvest volume and blossom drop and then I'm going to evaluate that next to the other ones for flavor. And then um, Kaletz is a plant that I'm planting that it, I got a seed for that is a sort of a hybrid of Brussels sprouts mixed with kale. And then garlic's not like this super unusual vegetable, but since they plow my community garden uh, every spring, things like garlic and asparagus, I couldn't put in every year down there because those are either overwinter maturing or those are perennials. Um, so I'm doing garlic in my containers and asparagus at my work garden. And then this year I, I tried a different pea that is going to be more of a bush snap pea as opposed to that really tall sugar snap because I think it might be a little easier to protect from deer. And then off the list, potatoes, sweet corn, and I grew a kabocha winter squash last year and, and boy, it underperformed com um, compared to my butternuts to the point of it's off the list. I'm just going to stick to my tried and true butternuts. And then a, a plant that I tried last year that is in the permanent rotation is a cauliflower variety called Song. And what makes this unusual is one, it matures pretty quick. In fact, this is a picture from just the other day. I'll be able to eat this cauliflower this week, but it's a little bit more of a sprouting variety, meaning that it has longer elongated florets. And so when you trim it off the base, it breaks apart really easy and it's really sweet and really tasty. So make sure that each year as you're growing stuff you keep a little bit of data I use my phone I take pictures um, I always want to add a, a new thing or two or three and I always want to make sure that I get rid of things that drove me crazy okay so here is a little tour of the garden that I shot um, this weekend when I was down there working the um, this is the leaks on the far allium this is uh, a new red onion that I am growing this year. I started them from seed. They're called Red Long of Florence. They turn into like a football. Here is a patch of, um, of some lettuces that I have in there. And when you look at this all the way back here, you'll notice that I have gone over and just said the heck with deer. I put in a seven foot tall deer fence and I wrapped it about half of my plot. We just have the worst time with nuisance wildlife down there, deer especially. And so things that deer eat last, I put in here. Uh, or things that deer eat first, I put in here. And things that they eat last, I put out here. I've never really had a big problem with deer uh, working on my alliums. I definitely have a problem with deer working on just about everything else. And then I put this lettuce outside. And if they found this, they would eat every one of these heads in one night. It would just be gone. 30, uh, 30 heads of lettuce instantaneously gone. But I keep them covered with row cover for basically deer protection. Um, I did get some bird netting and I'm gonna replace the row cover with bird netting to keep the deer out um, because as we get into some warmer temperatures, um, I don't want this to uh, get too hot underneath it, but I tell you, I did throw the road cover back over before this big heavy rain was coming because one, I didn't want the thunderstorms to beat this lettuce to death and two, give it uh, a five minute overnight and um, I am going to find that there is going to be nothing left from the deer. Okay, I see we have some raised hands. Um, I, I'm not gonna unmute the group because we have a fairly sizable group here. So make sure you dump questions in the chat or the Q&A and I see we have a bunch. So let's go in, in there and let me clean up my chat a little bit too. All right, we got, everybody's getting excited for garden. I am, this is, this is, this is looking like a good spring and it's been great so far. All right, Brian asks, going off the container density question, could I get away with two zucchini plants in a large 20 inch diameter container? Maybe Brian. And here is what I would do if I were you. The industry has recognized that lots of people grow in containers now, and they have actually started hybridizing varieties of vegetables of all kinds for container production. So I would look for a zucchini plant 
that has been optimized for container production so that you have a greater chance of success. And, and they do, they have ones for tomatoes. Uh, it's amazing what they have uh, available specifically for container production. All right, Jennifer says, I have a raised bed and I've already had success with garlic and I also planted carrots and zucchini and I'm planting two kinds of tomatoes and basils, good, but, um, and basils worked last year, but this year they did not. I got pole beans, I'm giving community, all right. Uh, chipmunks around the vegetables. So Jennifer, it sounds like you have an outstanding garden going good. Um, and we'll have to see what we get. And thank you for donating your produce. Uh, chipmunks, I don't have a big chipmunk problem down at Wallace because they would have to run a far distance to go in there. I don't really have a big groundhog problem there because I'm in the middle, but the periphery ones um, do that. And Melissa, you asked a great question. Why are potatoes off the list? And the reason is one, my heavy clay really makes them getting big difficult and my high pH really predisposes them to scab. And so I like to grow potatoes for like a new potato or a smaller size. And I found that, cause I don't wanna peel them. And I have found that I just have scabby potatoes down there because of that high um, pH. An anonymous attendee asks, which tomatoes are heat tolerant? Um, there's a there's a vast variety of tomatoes that are heat tolerant, cold tolerant, or, or have lots of different um, things that way. So the way I found it was is when I went on the seed catalog, I actually looked specifically for heat tolerant tomatoes. There's a, there's a lots of different varieties that do well that way, um, it, and you just have to do that research. And the better seed companies, when you're going through the catalogs, will actually list that. So those were grown by me from seed. Um, I, I don't think that any of the common varieties that you would necessarily purchase are going to have that label for here in Ohio. I will say that I note that things like cherry tomatoes or saladette style tomatoes generally tolerate the heat better and continue to set even during hot weather. And Judy asks, can you move a whole asparagus plant from one spot to another? Um, you might wanna do that, Judy, if you're very careful, and I would wait until after the fall so that that plant has gotten a full year's growth and has set all the energy that it needs in its roots before it emerges. So like my asparagus is all, all the way up and a lot of people's are all the way up. I wouldn't move it right now because you might stress that plant, which is in a, it's trying to actually grow and, and make its energy reserves for over the course of the season. You're going to have a better chance of success fully transplanting if you wait on that perennial until it is um, going to be, uh, you know, until it's got enough energy in there. All right. Good questions. Good comments. Uh, Catherine, those curved metal poles, um, you know, they are simply a row cover. Uh, you can buy them online. It's just forms for row cover. They're basically bent like that. You just stick them in the ground and, and it goes right over a patch. I don't have a specific name for those. I don't, I don't know where, I don't even remember where they came from. Um, I use them periodically. Uh, down there, I, I um, they they don't have tremendous weight bearing, and um, so like a lot of snow or something is going to not really work as well with these like they would with the PVC. Um, but when you want to get something up real quick, they work uh, really good. Uh, any number of some of the higher end catalog companies will carry those as well as online. All right, let me clean up the chat. We got some good comments, good questions. Uh, planting okra and beets from seeds and want to know if it's too late to start on the seeds this weekend. Nope, Ruby, it is not too late. In fact, I would wait on okra, um, but go ahead and plant beets. Beets can be planted um, and, and beets actually have a very wide tolerance for planting temperatures. And then I just bought a new hose too, Jennifer. Okay, we, we got some good questions flying in and out. All right. So like I said, inside, I'm, I don't have the space to start any new stuff. I will probably do some lettuce transplants once I free up a little bit of space. And uh, like I was saying, 
my space is crunched. Like a lot of seed starters, this is a really critical time. I would love to get my tomatoes and things out early. The problem is, is I've not found going too, too early is beneficial for these. And a lot of what I started in my basement are things that I grew from seed myself and I cannot replace them if they die. So seed starting outdoors. We are still in the heavy spring planting area and don't feel like you ran out of time. You can still get lots of stuff in the ground. Um, there's certain things that if I was planting them now that I would look at their maturation dates, quite honestly, just to, to see like a faster spinach because you want that maturing. Um, earlier if i was planting arugula now we're gonna it's gonna be maturing right in flea beetle season so you might want to just throw row cover over it the minute you do that um, but otherwise you're in good shape for a lot of these things peas planting now in early may i would probably go with a bush pea uh where like a sugar snap or something like that is not going to be um probably going to mature in the serious hot weather but otherwise plant away i mean we have good soil moisture now uh don't work the soil before it dries out a little bit because especially you you know if we have clay soil like I have in my garden it needs to dry out a little bit so I don't have like compaction or clumps or things like that and then remember to thin I harp on this a lot but I get lots of questions directed to me is like why did my radishes make radishes they only made tops and they really need that space in order to get what you want and then I hate to say that little time period that we have in the beginning of the season before the bugs come is over. I've already found um, two different bugs on my plants from scouting. One of them is slugs, especially if you put compost in like I compost and you add a bunch of organic matter, they love it. This slug was chewing on my radishes when I went into harvest. And then the other bug that I'm seeing around is the cabbage white butterfly. Once you get those brassicas in the ground, they are gonna find them. They are gonna lay their eggs on there. That is that green um, larval form that will seriously cause some damage. They can eat voraciously. Those cabbage white butterflies, a invasive, now the most common butterfly in Ohio, um, they're out. They don't mind cold weather, they don't mind hot weather and they are laying their eggs. So make sure you're scouting because you wanna catch them before they damage your harvest. Um, and I saw one laying eggs yesterday, which means scouting will be daily, trying to make sure that I find them, pick them off and get rid of them before they start either pooping in my food or eating my food and so this is um this is the radish patch and this is you know if you get good spacing on them that is what allows you to get radishes up to that harvestable size that you like plant more radishes i um i plant a long row or a patch of them in this time of year every two or three weeks but i really like my radishes so if you like your radishes keep planting right? Plant more. Succession plant. Lettuces, lettuces, your radishes, your turnips, spinach, carrots, all of those things. Um, you know, there's shade cloths. If we get a, a burst of heat, I'm going to be doing an, a, um, a research study with Franklinton Farms this year. We did one last year where we experimented with maturing some really um, heat intolerant cool season crops with shade cloth and, and we got some really good data so we're going to want to get um, I'm going to be doing some more experiments with that and then I'll be posting that on growing Franklin so you all can use that or maybe we'll do a class on it and then I'm going to jump in the chat and Q&A in just a minute gang but outdoor transplanting you can go to the nursery or the greenhouse and there's all kind of spring transplants that are out there your spring stuff is what you want to be putting in the ground right now all your brassicas lettuces um, bok choy onions you can find leeks you can find um, lots of different spring stuff spring stuff is out there and um, the weather's looking pretty good from that predictive model to get stuff out so this is the work garden and we had planted this a few weeks ago had to irrigate it was dry from a few weeks ago up until now um, but we've had great sun and great growing degree days so with irrigation and proper fertility added to it we were getting a bumper crop up here in um, one of the plots that we use for uh, for the school garden project that I work on so seed starting outdoors soon i had gotten some questions this week last week and we've already had questions in the chat right now what can we start outdoors in terms of summer things now this weekend we still have some cooler weather we still have temperatures at the lower end of the temperature spectrum that these plants like but quite honestly if you can protect them with some season extension 
and you have the extra seed, and generally we do, uh, it's very unusual for me to run out of certain kind of seeds when you know you get a packet and you have 50, 60, or 100 seeds in them. So if you have a space that you can put this and protect it. So I'll show you a picture like green beans, zucchini, cucurbits, generally you can get seed inexpensively for a lot of the common types of this and so here's a picture of my garden just in a pan and kind of starting from the lettuce patch that I showed you and here's the red onion patch and I still need to fill in um, some of the sunbelt on the paths you can see the fine weeds at Wallace that is all just weed growth that has occurred just in four weeks since they plowed um, here's the deer fence here's the brassicas on this side this light colored uh, uniform growth that is cover crop. I am going to be putting my peppers and tomatoes in that space, but I didn't want bare ground and um, I wanted a little weed smothering, which buckwheat can do. So I will mow this down and then incorporate it before I plant, or I might actually even no-till into this buckwheat. Just mow it, leave the residue and no-till the uh, stuff in there. But right here, you see a row cover patch that is inside the fencing. And inside this row cover, I planted about four or five days ago, a patch of green beans. It was a little cooler than they like, but my hope is that by putting some row cover on it and warming the area underneath the tunnel, I'm going to get an early start on my green beans, and these are going to get bigger than these uh, metal hoops will allow, so it had to go inside the fence or the deer will chow it. And then this is the picture that um, uh, I took of Miss Paula's cinnamon rolls or sticky buns or whatever. All I know is they were unbelievably delicious and I went back for two. So I'm going to leave that up there. It has my email and my contact and everybody can look at this and get starvingly hungry and wish that they had that. I wish I had some in front of me right now. Um, and go ahead and dump your questions in the chat and the q and I'm going to be going into both of them. Ann Poole asks, will cicadas bother our gardens this year? And maybe, honestly, um, I got some pictures sent to me already from some uh, uh, client residents of Franklin County that they have seen the emergence, the mud tubes from the NIMS, so we should have emergence soon. Um, I would be a little bit more worried about my ornamentals than my vegetables, I think. I would be worried if I had like some, some grapes or some fruit trees or you just put in some new ornamentals or something like that because they will do some damage potentially to the growing tips. Depending on where you're at in Franklin County, it's supposed to be a little bit worse in the west compared to the east. The person who has already started to see signs of emergence emailed me um, pictures from the Madison-Franklin border. Um, so super long answer to a question that is maybe. They're going to be coming soon. All right, Jennifer, good, good update on the arugula. Uh, Minister Aaron asks, is it too late to start melon seeds from transplants? And so um, I will say no. And the reason I say no is, is I haven't even started my melon seeds for transplant yet. And but I do mine a little bit different. My heavy clay impedes germination. It can make it very problematic. It can keep um, even big seeds like melons from coming out. So I start them, but I don't let them mature for a long time. I, um, I want them to just get to like one or two true leaves and then I put them in the ground because they just get too big for being under the lights. So you can still start melon seeds from transplants. Um, in fact, I probably need to start thinking about starting mine soon. Generally, I put them out when they're about seven to, seven to 10 days um, from first emergence. And then Jennifer, good comments on composting and things like that. I use compost in my garden. Um, so Brian, any garden plants we need to worry about cicadas impacting? We just mentioned that. Um, the young growing tips on ornamentals um, or trees are gonna be where, where we might see some damage. Generally, they're not super devastating unless you are in an area where, where there is a tremendous mass emergence, which is not really supposed to be Franklin County, but if it does happen to you, um, then that's cold comfort, I guess. And so Jennifer shares that um, the Civic Garden Center has some heritage seeds available if you guys need some. And then Judy asks, once the radishes are up, how far apart should you space them? I like to have about three inches from between my radishes, maybe four inches. Um, I find that that works pretty good to minimize wasted space. 
and um, and and go from there. All right. Judy asks, would you ever plant onions in with your potatoes? Um, generally, I'll be honest, Judy, I don't really follow companion planting, um, you know, recommendations. I've seen that online. Uh, Cornell has a really good fact sheet about that. Most of it's anecdotal, and, and I don't want to minimize that because anecdotal can be very powerful if you notice something over time. Um, I, <clears throat> I've found that that I like to kind of space mine out a little bit different because their harvest times can be different and their fertility needs can be different, which means that like I'm going to have generally most of my onions, depending on variety, coming out at different times. Their green onions get harvested at different times. Uh, and, you know, when I'm doing my potatoes, I'm hilling my potatoes up, meaning that I would be putting some dirt where they might actually get in uh, where the leaves are of the onions. And, and then I have to make sure that I'm really diligent about washing in between those. So I don't, but I have seen where people use that as part of a companion planting. Uh, anonymous attendee asks, if not protecting them, when is a good time to plant summer veggies? Generally, the recommendation is you plant your summer veggies when the soil warms up closer to that 70 degree temperature that it likes. And, and you can find the uh, soil temps in Franklin County um, by going to the OARDC weather station. Uh, they have soil temperature readings for the various research farms for Ohio State. And um, I will dump that link in the chat. And then you want to get past that that frost date. Average frost date for here is um, mid-May. All right, so I'm going to stop the share, and I'll keep answering questions. But while I'm doing that, I'm going to I'm going to pull up a link to um, dump in the chat about the OARDC. And I'm going to do generally a statewide one, and you can find the station that's closest to you because I realize we do have some folks here that are um, answering from different places. So I'm putting that to all um, attendees and things in there. Okay. Da, 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 da. So that's in chat if you want to look up the weather station. And so let's see. Ruby asks, I'm planning to use garden fabric on my three beds. What are your pros and cons for using garden fabrics? Um, pros are mostly pro. Uh, I really, really like using row cover because it is easier to manage than, say, a plastic. It's porous. It lets sunlight through. It lets air through. It lets uh, moisture through. It can overheat a little bit. Um, and you have to be delicate when you handle them because they can rip and I like to get multiple years out of mine. Cons would be that it can get a little bit too warm underneath them. And if you have plants that are pollinator dependent and you cover them and the pollinators can't get there, then that might, um, that might uh, cause a problem with your amount that you would get. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, there's, you can find some, you can find some good information out there on recommended stuff. And then I, re I recommend that go for it. Experiment with things like that. Um, see what works best in your system, because that's always some of the fun of gardening. I try new things every year. I, I do that intentionally because I'm always looking for something new uh, and exciting to grow that, that will then go in the permanent rotation. So, uh, Minister Aaron asks, what should soil temp be in the high tunnel for eggplant and zucchini? Same as it would be outside. You want it close to that 70 degrees. Now, in the high tunnel, you have a chance to get to that much earlier than you would growing outside, right? Because you have the passive heat generation and, um, and does that things. So, Judy asks, what is your opinion on worm castings? I like them. Um, I, I, uh, I think that adding that organic matter and the fertility in there is uh, generally pretty beneficial for growing. Make sure that you're not over nitrogening certain plants, um, that too much nitrogen is going to be negative for them, like a lot of the root vegetables. Uh, too much nitrogen, you get too many tops. Too much nitrogen on your beans, you get too many leaves. So ideally, if you have worm castings, you want to see if it does have a fertility recommendation with it so that you can um, you can know what you're putting down uh, if you're using that as a fertilizer. Okay, Tim says we had our home compost tested. NPK was 
pretty good, but very high iron and aluminum. Uh, is it okay to use in the garden? Um, Tim, I don't know offhand. In fact, the I I to find levels like that. What I would ask is, I'm going to have to do research on that. I was actually talking to a soil scientist before, and I had done a test for a home grower because they wanted to know the iron levels in their soil if they had enough for a tree that they were growing. And when I talked to the soil scientist at Penn State, I said, what are the normals? Because I wanted to know what the normal range was for the micronutrients. And he said, we don't actually have those calculated. Um, and so I'm not sure if I'll be able to find, but we'll try to find. Um, uh, and I don't even know if, if that is something that we can, but we'll take a look. Personally, I have not tested micronutrients when I do compost. Um, I've analyzed both a commercial and a sort of cold municipal compost and their fertility was off the charts. It was amazing what was in there, but we didn't do micros. And so we'll have to see, um, we'll have to see MSU standard compost test. Oh, compost test, interesting. Yeah, I would like to see that, Tim. So feel free to send it me that because that sounds like something that I want to learn about. Okay, we're gonna bop back in. Um, all right, thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, it sounds like Jennifer's got an active garden going in her place. Lots of good comments. All right, gang, good questions coming at me. Everybody's getting excited. So what to do now in your garden, okay? We just had a ton of rain and probably not too, too much rain. And, and this was a needed rain. Ohio, in terms of how the agronomic crop outlook was, we were pretty dry and we had most of our water table across the state was below. So um, this was a needed rain in terms of how people were growing. And, and I would agree with that in terms of what I had both at my house, at my work and at my community garden. I'm not worried about this being too much rain. I would say that if you have fertilized with a slow release granular fertilizer, you're probably okay. If you've been using just a water soluble fertilizer, you might find that if it was labeled to go for a week or two, if we, and I'll have to check the rain gauge, but I'll bet you we got between two and three inches, you might find that you do need to add a little bit more into your, um, into your system just to make sure that you capture the beneficial effects of that. When we go back and we take a look at that 15 day, the majority of those days had that chance of precipitation and that goes right along with what the weather predictions were for May. So make sure that you identify your planting windows for putting transplants and putting other things in and make sure that if you, um, if your soil's too wet to work, don't work it until it gets dry enough to do that, which might be a little bit of a challenge for some folks, including myself in my heavy clay river bottom um, growing area where I'm gonna have too much um, water in my soil to plant unless I find a really good time to, um, to, to allow some drying. One thing that I need to do, and I had brought down the um, hay to do it, is I need to put mulch around my leeks and my onions and my lettuce and my brassicas. I had brought it down there before this weather was coming and the problem is is it's pretty fine i actually um, got some uh, of the loose stuff from the dairy farm over here that had fallen off the bales when they moved them and my worry would be that i didn't want to put it down at the time because a big gust of wind it was just going to carry it all over my community garden but that's on my list of things to do is get some mulch down to make sure that i am keeping a lot of this moisture inside the soil so it's available to my plants um, so that they can maximize their growth once we do get some sun. And I see we have worked through the questions. So what I'm going to do is I am going to give Miss Paula a chance to, um, to uh, have any final comments before we let everybody go and get yourself some dinner or whatever you need to do. Uh, I appreciate everybody from, for coming and um, I will be putting out links for our June 
community garden partnership uh, soon, as well as I will be uploading this recording to our OSU Extension Franklin County YouTube channel because I did get some emails from folks saying that they were not going to be able to make it and they definitely wanted to see the recording. Well, thank you, Tim. As always, this was a super informative session. And I always I always appreciate those tips on what we should be doing right this minute in the garden. I know sometimes when I go out to my garden, I'm almost overwhelmed because there's so much to do and trying to figure out what should I be doing at this precise seasonal moment. So that's really, really, really helpful. And you know, you're always welcome to come out on Saturday whenever we have snacks, which is every Saturday. <laughs> Yay. All right, gang. It has been a wonderful conversation with you all and um, everybody stay safe and I will see you in a month. If you have any questions for me, feel free to send me uh, those questions via email to mcdermott.15 at osu.edu and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thanks.